hope you had an excellent weekend. This is a video that I really been wanting to make for a while just because I think about my own training quite a bit and I really like making this whiteboard content. It's been a little while. For those that are new to the channel, I am not gonna be that guy that's gonna pump out super edited videos all the time with the quick tips. I'm gonna make those when I have something to say and quite frankly, when I feel like making them. I can't enjoy what I do if I feel beholden to tickle the algorithm every two seconds with my videos. So I've been wanting to make something educational. Part of what my brand is all about is giving to people that watch me, you know, giving them tools to be able to help themselves freely. You know, each one teach one, each one reach one. I want y'all to be able to navigate training. I want y'all to not have to pay someone to know how to navigate training. And I want y'all to get jacked and stacked and juicy. What we're gonna talk about today is my own training and then just some principles and concepts that came into play with how I've changed my trainings from what I had been doing. So for those that are new, I have been bulking for about seven and a half months. I still am bulking, but I wanna have you know a few months where I'm training for strength now that I've gained a lot of size. Um, what my training looked like before this was pure hypertrophy. So the exercise selection wasn't too different. The ways that I was doing these exercises was different. Instagram has, you know, a lot of my training in terms of what I had been doing. If you're interested, please check those out. I usually leave like blog style posts where it's just my thoughts on what I'm doing, how I'm doing it and why. Check that out. It's a really good resource. With your training, because we always want to make this relatable back to what you need to do and not just talk about myself because some of y'all might not give a fuck, to be quite <laughs> frank with you. Um, three foundational principles that you want to keep in mind. You want to stay in the pocket. I got that from Joey Flex. Um, he is one of the greatest powerlifting coaches of all time. If you're not familiar with who that is, please look him up. He's an excellent resource for strength training and then just overall you know, becoming a better coach. He, has, he makes really good content for that as well. Staying in the pocket essentially means that you don't go too heavy, you don't go too light. You stay right where you're supposed to be so that you can progress consistently throughout your training program instead of having spurts and then valleys where you're not making any progress at all because you, you went heavy too quickly in your training program. We're dudes. We're gonna lift heavy sometimes. It's gonna happen, but if you make this a habit, staying in the pocket a habit, all this is gonna be a lot more consistent for you. Now specifically, specific, when you're training for strength, and I didn't put specificity here because I don't know how to spell that shit without uh, autocorrect. Uh, the spelling be busted my ass, y'all. I have to, I, I can't lie to y'all. But anyway, when you're training for strength, you wanna make sure that you keep your exercise selection specific. Whereas with hypertrophy, your main purpose is to stimulate your muscles with the best stimulus to fatigue ratio, as Dr. Mike Israel likes to put. Uh, has he likes to put it rather so whereas you know I might do like an incline bench here and then you know maybe someone would do good mornings over there those aren't the most specific to getting like the big three lifts or variations of them bigger to be honest with you because they're not the most specific stiff leg deadlifts are very specific to regular conventional deadlifts or even sumo deadlifts Larson press is extremely specific to a regular competition style bench press. Specificity is something that you wanna keep in mind. Now with specificity, you also wanna have that measure of hypertrophy as well, which we'll talk about in a second. And then most importantly, last but not least, you gotta keep this shit simple. If you're thinking about, oh, well, I don't know what I'm gonna do this workout and damn, my, my percentages were off 0.2%, what do I do? Listen guys, like, People that message me asking me questions, that's always welcome. But a lot of these questions are just uh, people getting lost in the sauce. People getting in their own heads about things. Your percentage back downs do not have to be the exact percentages that I talk about in these videos. The principle of the matter is, is that you had a hard top set and then you slash some weight off for the back off set so that you can continue to get in quality volume. Don't let this shit get in your head too much. Use simple things like dynamic double progression that we're gonna talk about in a second. Just beat the book sometimes. Do more weight or reps or sets than you did last time on something that's a smaller exercise. You know, 
just freaking make things simple. If you make things simple, you're gonna make sure that you're emphasizing the right things, which is effort. Now just to talk about, and we're gonna go through each training day, um, specific exercises and why and how and all that. Starting with the upper body one. This is different in the capacity of all of this from, you know, seal rows down is pretty much the exact same as when I was doing my hypertrophy training. The only difference is, is that we're starting with the wide grip bench press because I do want to peak my wide grip bench. Last time I talked about doing this, I injured my pec in a non-training related incident. Uh, <laughs> um, but my way of approaching it this time is going to be a little different. It's a funny story about training, y'all. You come at a point in time where you know enough to know that you know nothing, and you have to also understand that there have, there are people that have been doing this longer than you that may know something that you don't. One of those individuals that I'm referring to is Freaky D, Dennis Arnold. I was talking with him uh, maybe a few months ago, talking about how I eventually wanted to transition from hypertrophy to strength, and just talking uh, you know, about one of the things that I was doing, which I think it's called a plus set. I don't know what the fuck it's referred to, but it's essentially where you do an AMRAP and then you do like a, you know, two thirds of the reps on the back downs or something like that. And how that was really potent for hypertrophy for me because it's, it is really good. And he basically just said like, look, uh, I, I, I essentially bench your squat and here's how. So you basically invert that. And instead of doing the AMRAP at the beginning, you do it at the end and you do your submaximal sets at the beginning and that's really good for strength. And I was like, man, that makes a lot of sense. And he went into just describing how he learned that from someone and someone learned that from a legend. Each one teach one. So use the shit that I'm telling you here, learn it, pass it on to someone else. What this basically looks like though, is that you take a percentage of a training max and you do some sub-maximal sets with it. So like for example, two sets of five, and then your last set is an AMRAP. Why you do the AMRAP at the end is because this shit is going to feel very easy at the beginning, especially if you're using a lower percentage of your one rep max and you're using lower reps. This might be like 65% two by five. My purpose here is to get into a good technical groove make sure that my leg drive is really good, get into the habit of doing like a regular pause where I'm sinking into my chest a little bit, as opposed to doing a t-shirt touch pause. This AMRAP is just basically to get a little bit of hypertrophy, but just mentally make me feel like I'm doing something. This is a great quality of life feature for you guys that wanna implement this. This is good for strength. This is not good for hypertrophy. Let me say it again. I am not saying that this is good for hypertrophy. If you want it to be good for hypertrophy, invert this and then do more reps on the back downs. Don't misapply these things. So this is specifically for strength. After the bench press, we're going right into my seal rows and the periodization that I'm using is dynamic double progression. Alex Bromley made an excellent video on this that I'm gonna link in my description under the resources section for those that wanna learn it goes by many names, the rep goal system, evolving rep ranges, like it's all the same shit for real. Watch that video if you would like to learn more about that specifically. But this is really good for if you have an exercise that is more of a hypertrophy slot. Just because you train for strength does not mean elements of your training do not have the purpose of hypertrophy. Vice versa with if you're prioritizing hypertrophy. Here's where one of my favorite exercises comes into play in terms of accessories for bench press are football bar presses. Football bar presses are very slept on in the powerlifting sphere. Almost everyone that does a football bar bench tries to load up like their standard weights for regular bench pressing and then they get bogged into oblivion because the bar is really good. Specifically why I like it is because it's unstable, it forces you to push throughout like the entire range of motion. So it builds what we call mid-range and end-range strength. So at the middle of your range of motion where a lot of people are weak at, it forces you to be strong where the bar is doing this shit. Likewise with the lockout. I'm using step loading for that though. Um, that is referenced in my Berserk Method self-coaching video. That's linked under most of my videos now. Um, check that out if you'd like to hear more about step loading specifically. 
After that, everyone's favorite upright rows, big shoulders help bench presses. Sorry guys, shoulders get used quite a bit on the bench press. It doesn't have to be an overhead press. In this slot right here, I may have like a seated non-back supported overhead press at some point, but right now it's upright rows because I enjoy doing them and they do what I need them to. After that, I'm following up with some cable crunches and tricep rope pushdowns. That's how that first upper body session comes into play. Right after that, so it goes upper, lower, so no rest days in between this, comes my first lower body session. So with my first lower body session, what I have in terms of what I start out with is a belted front squat. That's gonna be a top single and then some back downs. The way I like to focus around these back downs is that I have two weeks, so two week waves, right? So I do two weeks of fives, two weeks of fours, and so on. This top single is, you know, you could say it's RPE based. I'm really just going by what I feel good for that day. So last week it was something easy because I was on a deload. This week it's gonna be a little bit heavier. Next week after that, it might be a little lighter or even heavier. Like I said, it's just based off of what I feel good for for the day. I am trying to build upper back strength and core stability with the front squat as well as leg strength, quite honestly. Now in terms of the deadlifts, it's following a similar structure to the bench press. The only difference is that I, I might do an AMRAP after these submaximal sets. This will tie in with the stiff leg deadlifts that we do on lower body too. Talk about that when we get to it. This should feel light at the beginning because you're doing three week waves. It shouldn't start to feel challenging until that third week, right? Now, something cool that I want to talk about is that when you do three week waves, so like say for example, you do three weeks of fives and then you go to fours, your first set of four should be with something kind of light so that it somewhat works as a deload so that although you're reducing reps, you're not just automatically just going to like an even heavier weight because that's not a tenable approach. If you're just going heavier, 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 heavier harder, 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 like you're, you're going to burn out with that. You have that first week of force kind of easy to alleviate some of that fatigue. Now, after these two main exercises, these are the big boy exercises. Pull downs, gotta work my upper back. Um, I really love chest to bar pull downs. I love the way Dr. Mike Israel tell coaches with that. Uh, and that's the way that I do them myself. I do what's called a plus set. I referred to this earlier. I don't know if that's what it's actually called. That's what I call it. So essentially what this is, you do an AMRAP at a specific weight, and then you do like two thirds of the reps, 75% of the reps, it doesn't fucking matter, just do less reps on the back downs. Really good for hypertrophy, really good for getting a lot of volume. Now, hack squats. These are something that I started doing recently, um, thanks to my boy Sam Sheether. Um, he mentioned to me how Dan Green did them a lot, and that just reminded me, like, yeah, he does do them a lot, because Dan Green is a very posterior chain dominant lifter. I'm a very posterior chain dominant lifter as well, and he used the hack squats to bring up his quads, you know, as one of the exercises to bring up his quads. How I do them, right now anyway, is with the super squat style. A little different though. So I start week one tens, week two 12s, week three 15s, week four 20s. Now this might look a little different as with everything in here. This is just, you know, how I have it mapped out. Slight deviations may come and probably will come. So I may do 14 here, 17 here, 22 here, or I might do 13, uh, 16, 21. Essentially, I'm just doing more reps each week, guys. So you don't have to follow these exact numbers if you wanted to start implementing these things in your training program. I really like super squats because they are extremely stimulating to your leg musculature. The reason why you really can't do them with squats year round is because your lower back fatigue also gets hugely stimulated with super squats as well. Hack squats are an excellent exercise to use this training methodology for. Your quads are extremely resistant to volume, to intensity, if you remove outside limiting factors like your lower back and your hips. Hack squats do exactly that. I'm gonna milk this for a little bit and then I'm gonna go to dynamic double progression just like with the sail rows. 
and then I'll alternate between the two. And that's kind of how I, I'll, I'll uh, keep things fresh there, right? So with overuse injuries and you know making things fresh again, there's two ways you can do that. There might be three. I, I might name more than two as I talk about this. I'm not too good at math, y'all. But you either change the parameter in which you do the exercise, so that's the volume, intensity, um, or you know, like the rep quality or the cadence, or you change the exercise. If you change the way in which you do the exercise, that will give you a fresh stimulus. You don't have to necessarily change the exercise all the time. After that, I'm just finishing up with some smaller, you know, accessories. So the way I like to separate, you know, what that smaller accessory is, is that I have one day I train my adductors, one day I train my hamstrings. Adductors get used on hip hinges a ton. They get used on squats a ton. If you don't isolate a muscle group, you're not going to be able to get the most optimal growth possible. It just is what it is, and that includes adductors. Adductors are a prime mover in the squat. They're not the only prime mover in the squat, but also the quads, the glutes, um, the hips, the lower, you know, no, there's a bunch of muscles that come into play with moving a squat. If you want to maximize your performance on squatting, you're going to train your adductors directly. I like the good girl, bad girl machine, guys. Like, you're not less of a man if you use that good girl, bad machine. Um, I do that, same thing, plus sets. Then I train my calves too, just because I want to continue to train my calves, even though I'm training for strength. Uh, here I have weightlifter style back extensions. Again, just plus sets, and that is how I finish off the second lower, the first lower body day. This lower body day is very fatiguing usually. After this, I take a rest day or two, and then I go into my next upper body session. Next upper body session is the Larson Press. I have been doing that. You know me to be the Larson Press guy. Here I am doing it not necessarily for hypertrophy purposes, which is why I had been doing it, but for the strength purposes. Building your pressing strength in absence of leg drive makes this way like bigger in the potential lows that you can that you can push, right? So for example, if you have a 315 pound bench press and you get your Larson press up to 315, and provided you know how to use leg drive, your regular bench press will have gone up significantly. It's not a world shattering difference, so it might be, the difference between the two might be like five to 10%, depending upon the style of leg drive that you do. If, you, if you're like a toes up guy, in terms of the way that you apply leg drive, you know, your toes are up and your feet aren't planted in the ground, you might get like 5%. If you're a feet on the ground kind of guy, you might get like 10%. I don't know what that breaks down to mathematically. I think it's like a 335 bench press. You know? But this is a great accessory and the best accessory in my opinion. One of the best. I'm using the exact same periodization style as with the wide grip bench. You're doing those percentage based sets, sub maximal, and then one AMRAP. You know? From here, I'm going into weighted pull ups, dynamic double progression, or plus sets. I'll alternate between the two to keep things fresh. Low incline dumbbell bench press. This is one of those exercise slots where the goal is to train the stabilizers through a larger range of motion for extra hypertrophy. This is one of the movements in my program that is purely hypertrophy based. Bigger pecs and bigger prime movers equals bigger bench press outside of technique work. So you wanna make sure that you're including something like this in here. Just beating the books on this, quite honestly. I might do some plus sets, but really I'm just concerned with doing more reps and sets. After that, I'm working obliques, and then I'm doing the tricep French press. I talked about this in the Berserk self-coaching video that I just made, but if you're someone like myself, you have longer arms, don't really have a lot of training economy to do a lot of extra bodybuilding work for your triceps and biceps, I had a preparation phase where I was doing band work to get, you know, all this good shit in my elbows ready to be able to do this. You do the less fatiguing tricep movement first after that preparatory phase. So the tricep broke push down, very easy on the elbows for everybody, everybody can do these. And then you do the more fatiguing one later in the week. That's my second upper body day. Specific, specificity, pocket, simple, 
these two feed one another. This is the primary sessions, secondary session. Between these two, I would say this is definitely the primary session and this is definitely the secondary session. So primary, secondary, primary, secondary. More fatiguing, less fatiguing. More fatiguing, less fatiguing. I dropped my fucking marker. Good thing I have another one in my pocket. <laughs> you always stay prepared. My second lower body session comes after a day of rest from my upper body too. Here I'm following a similar structure in terms of exercise selection from the first lower body session, except for I'm doing beltless front squats and then paused back downs. But it's other than that, it's the exact same thing. Again, the purpose is to feed this. This should, this should feed this and vice versa. This should feed this and vice versa. This should feed this and so on. Synergy, synergy is what you're looking for. I'm, I should have put that down here, but I wrote too damn big. Pocket, specificity, simple, synergy. PSSS. Stiff leg deadlifts. I just recently did, uh, this last night, a 505 stiff leg deadlift. It was pretty easy. I saw that Sam did uh, 505 for four belt lifts um, and then did that 695 for two deadlift and then it is, we're, we're, we're rare enough to go for a 725 for two PR double. So I was inspired to hit something heavy yesterday. Stiff leg deadlifts are the best deadlift accessory, in my opinion. You know, everybody has their own opinions. My opinion is that the stiff leg deadlift is the best deadlift accessory. You do stiff leg deadlifts, they're gonna make your deadlift bigger on their own. Um, in the past, I really used to purport the use of RDLs. I still do, but here's my current thoughts on that. The difference between an RDL, especially where you're using a partial range of motion and a stiff leg deadlift, is kind of the comparison that I make between like, uh, you know, you fill the bar up with bumper plates and you use fingertip grip on straps and then you do sumo, right? You're skipping out the bottom most portion of the range of motion, which is the hardest, most stimulating part of the lift. You're gonna be able to lift a lot more weight when you do that. Likewise, if you do an RDL, yeah, you're still doing a hip hinge. Yeah, you're still getting a good stretch on your hamstrings and on your glutes but you're missing out on that lower back rigidity when you skip that bottom most range of motion. Same thing with the stiff leg deadlift and the RDL. Um, stiff leg deadlifts just give better transference. Now, in terms of how you wanna do them, make sure that you pause at the bottom. I never coach a full release for a similar reason why I coach controlled guided eccentrics, not controlled, I'm not telling you how to do slow eccentrics on deadlifts because that's fucking stupid um, for strength. But you want to guide your eccentric down so that you release back into a good starting position. I do coach still pausing at the bottom of stiff leg deadlifts where you touch the plates to the floor and you don't fully release them just because you want to challenge that bottom most range of motion and hold tension in that bottom most range of motion um, just to get more out of the movement. That's our segment on stiff leg deadlifts. It's the same thing. Top set back downs. Uh, last night I hit 505 for one. It was easy. I was tempted to do two and then move up in weight, but I said, this is a D load. I'm just gonna do the one. And then I did some back downs. After that, I'm doing strict curls. It's a little bit different for those that are, uh, you know, OGs to the channel. I usually have four back sessions. Here I have three back sessions and one arm session. Simple reason behind that, guys, is that I saw Kiriakos Grizzly do a 30 piece with 110 pounds or 50 kilos. I'm like, dude, I wanna do strict curls now. <laughs> so I replaced one of those back days with a strict curl session. I'm just really just trying to maximize my performance on these strict curls. After that comes a squat motion pattern, not limited by your back. This is something that Sam and I have found a lot of success with in his training, as well as having this 1.5 times frequency on deadlifts, right? So you have your deadlift day and then the SLDL day. This has led to a lot of success on his deadlift specifically. I'm really excited for him to hit that PR double. Something that I implement with myself as well. Right now I'm really liking the Hindu squats with the SSB, just really elevating my heels, really, Knee is really far forward, isolating tension on my quads. 
After that, I work my hamstrings and then I do leg extensions. And that's pretty much how it breaks down, y'all. Let me know if you have any questions about this. I'd be happy to answer them. Y'all have a beautiful day. Bye-bye.